this morning, God, for gathering us all here. Thank you for another beautiful day, God, before the heat comes. We pray for those that are still traveling to get here, Lord, that you keep them safe and bless their hearts. And now, Lord, we would just ask that you'd help our attention, Lord, that we would give our attention to you and realize, God, that somehow, you always have us in mind. We thank you for that, Lord. Somehow, we, uh, you always give us your complete attention. So thank you, Lord. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. Your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb.
lost a battle from fear. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move through and touch our hearts, Lord. We thank you, God, that we have you to turn to all the time. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you sit down, maybe turn around and say hello to someone. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Walnut Creek. Really glad to be with you all this morning. So glad that you're with us. Got amazing uh, weather today, which is always nice as well. Uh, 
but I'm Jared. If I've not met you before, I'd love to meet you afterwards. Uh, don't leave too quickly. Um, if you're new or newer, we'd love to be able to connect with you. If you would uh, grab one of these connect cards on our welcome table where you first came in, fill that out, and then leave it with us. You can put it in one of the boxes there. We'd love to be able to follow up with you and be an encouragement to you in your uh, walk with the Lord. Um, also, if you need prayer for anything this morning, we have prayer request cards on the table where you came in. Fill those out. People pray for those requests each week. And um, also, we have a prayer team at the end of each service during the closing songs that would love to pray for you. So take advantage of those people as well. So that's in the corner of the room during the, the final songs of the service. And then um, my mic not working. Check. Oh, I don't know what happened. I didn't even touch anything. Um, and then uh, we'd love to have you participate in Believer's Communion during the closing songs this morning. So if, you are of a, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've put your faith in Jesus for salvation, love to have you come forward during the, the final song of the service, take the communion element back to your seat, and uh, just remembering what Jesus has instituted for us, his blood that was shed, his, his body that was broken for us, uh, to do those things in remembrance of him. And then home groups, still going for uh, just final month here at the end of May. We're going to be closing our home group season out, but there's still time to join. So if you've not been a part of one, uh, even if there's only, let's say, four left, like you've got time, join one. Just uh, grab a home group flyer, show up at either location on either Tuesday or Thursday night. All the information's there. Love to have you join in as we uh, spend time fellowshipping together, eating together, getting into the Word of God together, spending time in prayer together. It's just it's so special. Uh, and so uh, the, the Lord uses those times just so powerfully. And then extended fellowship after teardown today. And so if you guys are able to stick around, we'd love to have you maybe grab something locally if you didn't bring your food with you this morning and join us out at the picnic tables uh, after service, and if any of you are available to stick around and help with the teardown, usually on extended fellowship days, uh, the teardown part can kind of fall through the cracks, and so if you can stick around and help with us with that before you grab food, that would be awesome. And then during the time of extended fellowship, we're having a baptism today, about 1 p.m. I know, it's awesome. We have Currently, six people that are going to get baptized today, maybe some others who uh, didn't sign up but, but plan to get baptized, want to get baptized. There is going to be a short class that I, I want everybody being baptized to be a part of, so everybody knows and is in the loop of like what baptism is, what it isn't. Um, and so about 10 minutes after the service ends, out at the tables, uh, Jared Wiener is going to be out there, he's going to lead that class uh, with you guys, and so make sure to be out there for that, and um, if you didn't sign up and you want to get baptized, just go. Be a part of the class. Uh, you may not even brought baptism-appropriate clothing. You can get baptized in jeans. You don't have to have special clothes on. There's not some special garment that you need. You just need you and some water, and so uh, love to have you get baptized today if, you've, if that's you. And so uh, be a part of that. About one o'clock, we'll do the baptism. And so if those getting baptized can uh, change into their clothes, be ready, be at the tables around 1245 so we're not having to look for people, that would be awesome. And then lastly, we're starting a discipleship course next Sunday that we're calling our Firm Foundation class. There's going to be 14 total classes. And I know that that can sound a little daunting, like for some people that you might go like, I want to be a part of the class, but I know I'm going to miss a few, like, that's okay. Like, be a part of it. Go to all the ones that you can. We want you to be a part of it. That's you and you're going, hey, I'm newer in the faith, or you know what, I've, I've been a believer for a while, but I, I, I would love to get more grounded in just the essentials of the faith. Sign up. Uh, if that's you and you want to be a part of the class, there's a class syllabus on the welcome table that uh, those that uh, sign up for the class can grab, has all the dates, what you're going to be studying, all the information, 
And then there's also a different little packet of papers there that is your first week's homework. So grab that as well as the syllabus. Look at that ahead of time. And then next Sunday, uh, when you guys have your first uh, class together, that's what you're going to be going over. So you can kind of get familiar with it, get kind of prepared. And then if you have any extra questions, you can just address those to Jared number one, as I like to call him. Jared's not in the room currently, but you see him running around each Sunday morning. I believe he's keeping an eye on the baptismal outside. But um, love to have you be a part of that. Sign up today. Classes are about an hour and a half long, but that's also taking into account the, the eating, people eating together during the time. Each Sunday after teardown, 1230 to 2 roughly. Uh, and so love to have you be a part of, of that. But let's pray. Let's give our morning to the Lord. Father, thank you so much for today. Lord God, thank you for this time to gather in your name. Lord, is your, your people, Lord God. Lord, that we can, you know, as we're reading through the book of Nehemiah, we're studying about the nation of Israel and what you did at that time in that post-exilic period of, of Israel's history. That, Lord, as believers in Jesus Christ, that Peter wrote that we are a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your own special people, Lord, that you've called out. Lord, we don't replace Israel, but Lord, by faith, we get to be a part of the family of God. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that the promises of God are yes and amen for us today. Lord, that we can trust you, we can take you at your word. Lord, that you are with us, you're here even this morning, Lord. Your spirit is working. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us, that you'd have your way among us and inside of us, Lord. Lord, that you would, God, help us to focus in on you, Lord, to tune into you, to hear your voice. Lord, to tune out distractions, Lord, to lay any burdens, any cares that we might be carrying at your feet. And Lord, would you bring whatever kind of word we need, Lord, if that's a word of conviction and correction and rebuke, Lord, do it. Lord, if it's a word of encouragement and comfort and, and just building us up and giving hope, Lord, then do that. But Lord, would we leave this place transformed people because, Jesus, we've met with you. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you now. Lord, would you send your word forth in power? Lord, would you please anoint and use me and give me the gifts and the words to speak? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 7. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, never mind. I was going to say there's Bibles on the table, but there's actually not. If you have a Bible app, that's the next best thing. Nehemiah chapter 7. This morning we're diving back into our study through the book of Nehemiah, and today we're going to be looking at a study I've titled, Taking Care of What's Been Built. Our main text is Nehemiah chapter 7, the entirety of it. But let's actually go back just a, a little bit. We're going to start reading in verse 15 of chapter 6. So Nehemiah chapter 6, starting in verse 15. We're told there, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son, Jehohanan, had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. If any of you are still in the, the period of time of childbearing, I would just say a word to us. Where, at what point do we just go, let's just do like Peter, Luke, John, Matthew, and let's ditch Meshulam, Berechiah. That's a joke. You know the funny, like there's so many Bible names that were like, I would never name my kid that. But those are like the most prevalent ones usually in scripture is like the ones that are hard to uh, pronounce even. Anyways, 
That was just, it came into my head, I said it. So there we go, moving on. So much happened in those first six chapters that we've studied already in Nehemiah. It's incredible to think that what we saw from the beginning of chapter 3 to the end of chapter 6 all happened over the course of just 52 days. 52 days to do something that didn't happen in 92 years of the people being back in Jerusalem after returning from exile, and yet God did it. And he did it in such a way where even the enemies of the Jews knew that this work, the walls being rebuilt, was done by their God. So God got all the glory for what he did. But we also saw that the walls being completed did not mean an end to the opposition for Nehemiah. We gained more insight, as we just saw at the end of chapter 6, into the sinful compromise that existed in the lives of many of the Jewish people who had pledged themselves to Tobiah the Ammonite, who was their enemy. The first six chapters have focused on the rebuilding and renewal of the city of Jerusalem, the walls and the gates. But now the last seven chapters are going to focus on the rebuilding and renewal and revival of the spiritual lives of the Jewish people in Judah. I want to share a quote from pastor and Bible commentator Warren Wearsby before we start digging into these verses in chapter 7. He said, The walls were completed, the gates were restored, and the, and the enemy was chagrined. But Nehemiah's work was not finished by any means. Now he had to practice the truth Paul emphasized in Ephesians 6.13, and having done all to stand. Nehemiah had been steadfast in building the walls and in resisting the enemy, and now he had to be steadfast in consolidating and conserving the gains. Look to yourselves, warned the Apostle John, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward, 2 John 8. A city, he says, is much more than walls, gates, and houses. A city is people. In the first half of this book, the people existed for the walls, but now the walls must must exist for the people. It was time to organize the community so that the citizens could enjoy the quality of life God wanted them to have. God had done great things, uh, sorry, God had great things in store for Jerusalem, for one day his son would walk the city streets, teach in the temple, and die outside the city walls. And now with that context in mind, let's look at verses 1 through 3 of Nehemiah chapter 7. Verse 1 says, Then it was when the wall was built, and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. And I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. The the rebuilding of the walls and gates was only part of the work of rebuilding and renewal that the Lord was wanting to do in Jerusalem And with his people, and now with the walls and gates in place, there was still much work to be done when it came to where the people were at with the Lord. And so so with Nehemiah's focus shifting from the walls and gates needing to be rebuilt to the walls and gates needing to be taken care of, to be guarded, the people inside the walls and gates being protected and taken care of, he starts to appoint people to some important areas. First, we see in verse 1, was the gatekeepers. These new gates needed the right people monitoring them, who would make sure only the right people were being let in, and that the wrong people, like their neighboring enemies, were being kept out. These people had never known in their lifetime what life in Jerusalem with walls and gates being in place, was like. 
It's a weird thing to think about, right? Like you would think you live there, you've got Jerusalem is there, but the, the walls have been broken down for so many years, long before the exiles ever returned. But, but they didn't know what it was like to actually have these things back in place again. So in verse 3, Nehemiah gave some needed instruction to the gatekeepers that the gates of the city were only to be opened during the day when the sun was out and not at night. And that when the gates were shut, that they were to, to bar, to lock the doors. The gatekeepers needed to be mindful of the times, like at night or early in the morning while it was still dark, and also the situations like the gates not being locked, that could leave them vulnerable to enemy attack. And in the same way, you and I need to be gatekeepers of our own hearts when it comes to the times and situations where we can be more vulnerable to enemy attack, but also with what we allow access into our lives. You know, it's interesting the things that we sort of default to in our lives, you ever said like, yeah, I know that, but then you do it anyways? Notorious with kids, right? You tell them, you give them some sort of instruction, yeah, I know that, and then they do the thing that you told them not to do, or, you know, what, however that works out, and you're like, well, I thought you knew, like, I thought we were all on the same page here. We could go like, duh, like, of course the gates should be closed at night, of course, when they're closed, they should be locked. But they didn't live in a society, in a culture that had buildings like you and I. That wasn't the norm for them. They lived in tents. They lived in smaller structures that wouldn't have the same sort of thing that the walls and gates of Jerusalem now had. They needed to know things that we might take for granted. And the things that we take for granted is the things that often we are most vulnerable in. Like, yeah, of course I shouldn't go to that place. It's a, place it's, a, it's a point of temptation for me. Of course I shouldn't be looking at these things. Of course I, there, we, we have like a default in our mind. Like, of course. Duh. But then we're so, we're so not mindful. We're so not vigilant in those very basic things of protection that the enemy goes, I know where to get you. What's the nighttime for you and for me? What are those, what are those situations that we need to make sure that the, the, the bar of our heart is locked up so that the things that should not have access into our lives are kept out, but the right things are brought in? You ever find yourself keeping out the right things and then you let in the wrong things? Guys, we need to learn from this. We need to guard our hearts with all diligence, God's word says. And man, do we need the Lord's help, don't we? But along with the gatekeepers, we also see that Nehemiah appointed the singers and the Levites. For, for too many years, the worship life of the people of Jerusalem had suffered and been hindered because of the broken down walls, because of the burned down gates. But now as the gates and walls were completed, the singers and the Levites were appointed. These were those who played a role in helping the people worship the Lord in Jerusalem, not just in singing, but also in the bringing of their sacrifices to the temple. I like what David, David Gutzik said about this. He said, the singers and the Levites were there to lead the people in worship. The walls were not rebuilt so the people of Jerusalem could look at nice walls. They were rebuilt so they could worship God with greater glory and freedom than ever before. Every victory in our life should take us deeper into praise, he says. If we are not praising God more and more deeply with each passing year, are we really having much victory? Maybe we are making it through tough times, 
but coming out more bitter and sour than ever. He says that is not God's victory. His victory leads to a sweeter spirit and to deeper praise. Man, what great insight. Now, with unfaithful people who didn't fear God having prominent roles in Jerusalem for far too long, in verse 2 we see that Nehemiah gave the charge. He put in place faithful and God-fearing people to help lead in Jerusalem. He gave the charge of Jerusalem to his brother Hanani. Little nepotiz. No, I'm just kidding. It's a Jack Black reference. Uh, <laughs> remember, Hanani was among the first to tell Nehemiah what was going on in Jerusalem. So Hanani would have had a deeper connection to the brokenness. There, there was something that affected Hanani, obviously, at that early point in time when he came to Nehemiah to tell him what was happening when Nehemiah was still in Shushan. That, that Nehemiah knew he could trust Hanani. He, he knew that Hanani shared his heart for the people of Jerusalem in a way that maybe other people didn't. And then there was this other man named Hananiah who he made leader of the citadel. And the citadel was just a defensive structure there in the city of Jerusalem. See, Nehemiah had noted in chapter 5 how the Jews who took advantage of their countrymen did not fear God. Because if they did fear God, they would have obeyed his word and they would have actually cared for others instead of taking advantage of them. So when Nehemiah now looked for men to put in charge, he looked for those who were faithful, who had godly integrity, who were trustworthy. And he looked for those who truly feared God, a fear, an honor of reverence, a worship, a submission to God that caused them to live lives that honored and obeyed God. Isn't this the kind of people that every company, every family, every governmental system, every community needs in the people who are leading? Faithful. And and a fear of God more than many. There's so much compromise. There's so much that has happened in our world that finding faithful people is not an easy task. And maybe you find someone that faithful, but faithfulness doesn't equate a fear of God necessarily. Cool, you're faithful. You show up. You do what you say. But you don't have a love for the Lord. You're, you're, you can be faithful but not treat people well. You can be faithful but not be a good witness. You can be faithful and still be jacked up to your spouse. You can be faithful but be a horrible neighbor. But man, when these two qualities are paired together, faithfulness and a fear of God, a love for God, an, an honor of God, a worship of God, a submission to God, man, that is a powerful person to be used by the hand of God. That's someone who God wants to use powerfully. You might not be the most popular person because the world doesn't value the same things that we do necessarily. But in the eyes of God, who is he looking for? I believe he's looking for the same qualities today in men and women. Faithful to him. Who truly fear him truly worship Him, who truly love Him above all things. What we find more prevalent in our day day is a fear of man more than a fear of God. Man, I don't want to do that because I don't know what people are going to think about me. I don't want to say this to somebody. I don't know what somebody's going to think about me. I don't know how I'm going to look. I might look foolish. 
might try to share the gospel, and you, man, I'm stumbling over my words. And so there's this, there's this underlying fear that keeps me from actually just fearing God, loving Him, and letting that be the motivating factor of my life. But if we can just come back to those fundamental things, what would God do? What would God do in our homes? What would God do in, in a marriage? What would God do in a workplace? What would God do in a neighborhood? What would he do in Washington, D.C.? What would he do in Sacramento? If the people of God really, truly feared him and were faithful to him, man, would God call us to return if that's not us? <laughs> would we say even this morning, amen, Lord, so be it, do it with us? When Nehemiah looked for someone to put in charge to help protect and care for the people, he looked for someone who would care about the Lord and the things of the Lord above all other things. Knowing that care for the things of the Lord would be demonstrated outwardly in great care for the people of the Lord. We can't fear God, love God with all of our hearts, and then treat other people like junk. It doesn't work that way. And along with the instruction of the gatekeepers in verse 3, in, in that verse we also find Nehemiah telling Hanani and Hananiah, these newly appointed leaders, hey, look, appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. These are those that had skin in the game. You live there. If you live there, you're going to show, show a lot more diligence about being a guard. If you're like, dang, like I've got to protect the area near my home, my family's at stake, I think you're going to really be pretty vigilant as a guard. And this is what they were charged to do and who to look for. But, but look at verses 4 and 5. It says, Now the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people that they might be registered by genealogy, and I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. The, the completion of the walls of Jerusalem formed the shape and size of the city. They didn't scale it back because people weren't living there. Like, let's just, let's just make this a lot smaller. This is awkward got this big city, but no one's actually living there. Let's just bring the boundary line in a little bit, shall we? Like, no, keep it where it's supposed to be. Build the wall where it's supposed to be and let the Lord repopulate it. But it was large and spacious, and, and Nehemiah tells us there weren't many people living there. Why? Because of all the years of everything lying in ruin. Why would you want to live there? It was one of the most unprotected areas in all of Judah for you to live. You had more protection being in a village than you did in Jerusalem. And the houses were not rebuilt. So it wasn't just the walls and gates that had stayed in a, a state of ruin before this, but many of the houses in Jerusalem were still in ruin at this point as well. And yet God wanted to get his people back into Jerusalem. He wanted to see the city of Jerusalem flourishing once again. And so he stirred Nehemiah's heart to begin the process of bringing the people back into Jerusalem to live there. Nehemiah, by the leading of the Lord, and in obedience to what the Lord had put in his heart wanted to make sure that those who would come back and begin to live in Jerusalem again were those who had a right to live there as recorded Jewish individuals who had the right credentials under the original genealogical registry that happened when the Jews first returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel 92 years earlier. 
because of the sinful compromises that had taken place among the Jews where, where some had intermarried with the, the pagan Gentile people in the surrounding areas around Judah, it was important to make sure that those who put down roots in Jerusalem again were people who could prove their genealogical right to be there. And with that, we're going to move on and read through a long section of verses with a lot of names. But I want you to track with me and not zone out. Because between verse 6 and verse 73, it doesn't stop being God's inspired word. Do you treat certain passages of Scripture like that? That's not really that important. God thought it was so important, he left it here. In fact, this genealogical registry is, is found twice in Scripture, here and also in Ezra chapter 2. And so let's, let's do this. I jokingly said before service, should I tell people we're going to read 7,000 verses and then say, oh, just kidding, it's actually 73 to kind of soften the blow? <laughs> but now I've told you, so there you go. So let's read verse 6 and keep this thing going. Verse 6, these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his city. Those who came with Zerubbabel were Jeshua, also known as Joshua, Nehemiah, not the same Nehemiah that we're reading about here, Azariah, Ramiah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Nehum, and Bana. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172, the sons of Shephatiah, 372, the sons of Ara, 652, the sons of Pehath, Moab, the sons of Jew, J- Jeshua and Joab, 2,818, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 845, the sons of Zakai, 760, how many of you have found a, a new baby name? The sons of Benui, 648. The sons of Bebai, 628. The sons of Asgad, 2,322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2,067. The sons of Aden, 655. The sons of Ader, of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashum, 388, or 28. The sons of Bezai, 324. The sons of Hareph, 112. The sons of Gibeon, 95. The men of Bethlehem and Netophah, 188. The men of Anathoth, 128. The men of Beth Asmaveth, 42. The men of Kirjath Jerem, Chepharath and Beeroth, 743. The men of Ramah and Geba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nebo. So there's some other guy named Nebo. Not that one. The other Nebo, 52. The sons of the other Elam, verse 34, 1,254. The sons of Harim, 322. The sons of Jericho, 345. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, oh no, 721. The sons of Sena, 3,930. Now a little shift from sort of the, the patriarchal families now to the priests. The priests, verse 39, the sons of Judea, the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Immer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,247. The sons of Harim, 1,017. The Levites now. The sons of Jeshua of Cadmiel of the sons, and of the sons of Hodeva, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ader, the sons of Talmon, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatita, the sons of Shobai, 138. Now a different group, the Nethanim, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Tebioth, the sons of Kiros, the sons of Sia. The sons of Padon, the sons of Labana, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Salmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Giddel. What I should have just done was pointed. You say the sons of, I say the name. The sons of Giddel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Rhea, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazem, uh, Gazem, the sons of Uzzah, 
the sons of Paseah, the sons of Bezai, the sons of Meonim, the sons of Nephishesim, say that five times fast, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harhur, the sons of Basleth, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tama, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatifa. That's the, the, the Nethanim group. Now we have Solomon's servants here, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophereth, the sons of Perida, the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Giddel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pokereth, of Zebim, and the sons of Ammon. All the Nethanim and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. And these were the ones who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Kirub, Adon, and Immer, but they could not identify their father's house nor their lineage, lineage whether they were of Israel. The sons of Deleah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. And of the priests, the sons of Habiah, Habiah, sorry, the sons of Koz, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite, and was called by their name. These sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. And the governor said to them that they should not eat of the most holy things till a priest could consult with the Urim and the Thummim. Altogether, verse 36, uh, 66, we're going back now, 36, we're going to try that again. <laughs> Altogether, the whole assembly was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 men and women singers. Their horses were 7,036, their mules 245, their camels 435, and donkeys 6,720. And some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas, 50 basins, and 530 priestly garments. Some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the treasury of the work 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 silver minas. And that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas, 2,000 silver minas, and 67 priestly garments. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the Nethanim, and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And we're going to stop there. We did it, guys. While Nehemiah was going through the difficult task of gathering the people to register them, in verse 5, we're told he found a register of those who came up to Jerusalem in the first exile, and he decided to include that original registry here in his letter, which again is almost identical to the one given in Ezra chapter 2. But I want us to understand that this register of the genealogy of the first exiles is not pointless, even though it can definitely be hard to read through a bunch of names like we just did. In fact, a lot harder for me reading it out loud than it was for you to hear it. You're like, Jared, I would challenge you on that. <laughs> I think it was harder for me to hear you reading all those names. <sighs> Check out what Warren Wiersbe had to say about this. Where I'm double quoting him this morning. He said, Reading this long list of difficult names might be boring to the modern stu student, but these people were God's bridge from the defeats of the past to the hopes of the future. These Jews, he says, were the living link that connected the historic past with the prophetic future and made it possible for Jesus Christ to come into the world. Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7 are to the Old Testament what Hebrews chapter 11 is to the New Testament, a listing of the people whose faith and courage made things happen. Yes, this record is long. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of names. This record was from people in the past who were no longer even alive, given that they came to Jerusalem 92 years earlier. 
but there would not be any Jews there in Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day at all if those Jewish people in that record hadn't taken that step of faith to leave where they had put down roots in the Babylonian Empire during exile, uproot their entire lives and businesses and the community that they had built wherever they were, to return to the devastation that was Jerusalem at that time. You know, we could think, man, what an exciting thing. They got to go back to their homeland. It was like 70 years of being in exile. What an amazing thing. But you know what they were returning to? Just a bunch of destruction. They had built something completely new. Families had flourished over 70 years. I'm sure they had their business thing going and everything's going good. And, and life was probably a lot easier for them in a lot of ways. Wherever they were at in exile. And according to Bible scholars, just about 2% of the Jewish people, when King Cyrus gave that command to, rebuild, to, to go back, only about 2% of the people returned. 2%. So when we think about these names, when we think about this some 50,000-ish people, what did it mean? Maybe their name doesn't mean a lot to us, but you know what's awesome? It meant a lot to God. So much so that he's like, it's going to be preserved in my word twice. Twice. These people mattered to God. He valued them. He valued their sacrifice. He valued their step of faith. And what does that speak to you and to me? You know, Jesus said, look, broad is the road leading to destruction. There are many going down that road. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the road leading to life. And only few find it. The sign for us of doing the right thing, of walking by faith, is not found in how many other people are doing that thing going that way, choosing that kind of life. You know what it is? It's, it's obedience to what God said. That's where we find our validation for success. Our validation of like, man, God, does this please you or not? Is this the right thing to do or not? It's not if every other person that even calls them a Christian is doing the same thing. God, is it what you've asked me to do in your word? Because if that's what you've said, I want to be about it. And if I'm part of a 2%, not even of like the population of the world, but like a 2% of people who claim to be followers of Christ, Lord, I want to be a part of the few who you value, who you honor, who your names, who, whose, whose names are written in remembrance in your book. Because you know what? We could be written in the history books of this world and do a lot of things that mattered not a bit in the scheme of eternity. These people are rocking, man. Like, pff, all these crazy names, I couldn't even pronounce some of them. I just pretend like I can. <laughs> you don't even know. You think I'm pronouncing it right. None of us do, because we're not actually saying it in the original language. But they did it. They returned. And they did it because God had made a way where there was previously no way. They're in exile. They knew why they were in exile. Man, we rebelled against God. We got ourselves here. We got ourselves into this mess. And now we're, ha we're reaping what we've sown. And God's like, yeah, you did. <laughs> you did. And there was some judgment there for sure. But what about the grace of God that met them? Met them in the exile. 
God graciously drawing them back to himself, back to the land that he had caused them to be removed from, wanting to do a new thing. The, the work here was continuing on. The story was still being written, but the walls and the gates were only part of the work that God was wanting to do. See, more important than the city was the people and where they were at spiritually. And there was a work of revival that was coming, as we'll start to see very clearly in chapter 8. See, there had to be Jewish people who could trace their family lineage back who were living in Israel so that the rightful Messiah from the tribe of Judah descending from the lineage of King David himself could one day be sent into the world in order to walk among us, to reveal himself to us, to fulfill prophecy, to demonstrate his, his love and his grace and his power and ultimately die for us, rise from the grave and ascend to the right hand of the Father, and that was Jesus. Yeah, this is a lot of names. But this lot of names was part of what God was going to do. It was part of, of what God was doing in the greater redemptive arc to lead to Jesus coming to save us from our sins. So none of these names is pointless. But you and I may not go back and like do a deep dive into the names necessarily. But it's, it's, it's very much God's word, very much for us. Look at the second half of verse 73 with me. It says, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. In verse 4, Nehemiah noted that the city was large and spacious, but again, the people in it were few, the houses were not rebuilt. And now when the seventh month came, this is from like October to November, about a month after the walls were completed, we see that the children of Israel were in their cities, but the return of the people getting back to Jerusalem and living there isn't going to happen really until chapter 11. The, the walls and gates had been rebuilt, but there was still ruin on the inside of the city that prevented people from dwelling in the city of Jerusalem, but God wanted his people to dwell there. See, externally, things had been rebuilt, but internally, there was still work needing to be done where people could fully live in and enjoy what God had done and wanted to do. And I just, I see such a strong spiritual application here for us. How many people externally are all put together? I mean, externally, from an outsider's perspective, you, if you looked at their life, you would think, man, this person's got it all. Maybe beauty and physical strength, maybe financial wealth, a great job, a nice car, living in a nice house. Maybe externally, everything looks great and it's all put together. But internally, there can be ruins. A lack of being able to live in all that God has for them because they focused on the external and they've neglected the, the, the greater, more important internal spiritual work that God is wanting to see happen in each of our lives. How many of us have been guilty at times of prioritizing external things at the neglect of internal, the actual important things? Character, integrity, faithfulness, purity, holiness, a strong devotion to God. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You know, we, we, ha we live in this time, and I, I just, I'm seeing it more and more today. 
this phrase, just being your authentic self. There's this desire to see what's on the inside be showing on the outside. But that doesn't really matter if the inside is, is, is rotten, if it's ruins, if it's destruction, if it's just, all of it is just separation from God. God is looking at you and me today. He sees beyond the facade that you and I could put up. Because, man, can we put up a facade or what? Oh, yeah. oh man, it's easy. How many times, and you're like, no, I'm totally, I'm like, I'm that person. I'm like very genuine. It's like, how many times has someone asked you how you're doing and you actually gave them a genuine answer and didn't just say, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Like, you're not actually good. You just lied. I'm, I'm being like over dramatic now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but as we consider this, to, to, to not prioritize the wrong things, that we would say, God, I know you are deeply concerned with the internal me, the real me, my heart before you, my walk with you. And so, God, if all the external things look good, but inwardly I'm in shambles. And, Lord, I'm, my fellowship with you is damaged because of sin that I've allowed to have a place in my life. Then, God, the external things don't matter one bit. That we would have that sort of, that we'd be our authentic self with the Lord. So that he can deal with the authentic self and, and change our authentic self, to be more like Jesus. Because authentic self can just be an excuse for like, I am who I am, my sinful self. But there's also spiritual application for us in the people that Nehemiah appointed. What he looked for as the Lord led him in taking care of what had been built and what the Lord was still wanting to do spiritually in the lives of people. Look, spiritually, our God is wanting us positioned at the gates and on the wall. That we'd be watchful and prayerful and vigilant against our enemy. And also not allowing sinful, worldly, the wrong things to come into our lives. Our God is wanting us to be those singers, those worshipers. It doesn't matter how good you think your voice is. You know, sometimes we need to like, in a very gracious and loving way, be told, get over yourself. Worship's not about you, and it's not about how you sound. It's not about how you look. Worship is about God. It's for God. It's to be directed to God. He wants us to be those who rejoice in Him, to not be growing bitter and hardened and soured over time, but to have our hearts softened by the Lord where we become more and more worshipful, people who rejoice more and more in our God over the years and over the days. Our God is wanting us to be those Levites, so to speak, those servants of His faithful men and women of God who fear Him, who love Him, who honor Him, who live for Him in a day where those kinds of people are harder and harder to find. And our God is wanting to put things into our hearts too, that we would have that closeness of fellowship, that purity of life, that devotion to the Lord where He's able to easily get our attention and give us direction, that we would walk by faith in the things that the Lord has for us, His will, for His kingdom, and His glory. But there's one other point of spiritual application I want us to see, 
in verse 64, we were told that there were some who sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but it was not found. Therefore, they were excluded. You know, there's a different listing, a different record, a different book that names are included in in heaven. And that book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. And the only way to have our names written there, the only way to be included in the family of God, be made part of the people of God, is to repent of our sin and place our faith in Jesus Christ, receiving Him and all He provided for us through His death upon the cross. The only way to be saved, the only way to have our sins be forgiven, the only way to be made right in the eyes of the Father is by grace, is by the grace of God and through faith in the Son of God. And so as we think about that exclusion, look, if everyone here has put their faith in Jesus Christ this morning, our lives have been surrendered to His Lordship Our names are already there. We praise God for that. I mean, what does that mean for you? I mean, okay, cool. There's there's names written in this book. But this is just a physical book. Yes, it's the inspired word of God. It's living and active. But there's a different book. A book of life. A book of life. Where our names are even now. That we can rejoice over that reality, that truth, that promise. That because our names have been written there, that's where we will be as well as with Jesus forever. No one can take that away from you and me. But if there's anybody here this morning and you've not put your faith in Jesus Christ... That exclusion out of heaven is not because God doesn't want you included. It's not because you're not invited. If there's any exclusion out of heaven, if you spend an eternity separated from God in hell, it's not because He wanted you to go there. He wants you with Him. He wants you in heaven. But you have to do it His way. That means humility. That means surrender. It doesn't have to do with your church attendance. It doesn't have to do with how many times you've read the Bible. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? And this morning, if that's you and you want to be included in the Lamb's book of life, and right now, up to this point, you've not been because you've not made that decision for Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity as the worship team comes back up. Would you stand where you're at if that's you, that this morning you're going, look like, I want my name written there. So many people are caught up with having their name written here. I want a legacy here. I want people to remember me here. But all the best people eventually are forgotten. No matter how great you are, monuments crumble. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? It is. If it's not this morning, stand. Give your life to Jesus Christ this morning, if that's you. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you that just as you, Lord, made sure that the the people of that first return of exile, that they they were remembered because you valued them, Lord. You valued them because of their faith. Lord, that, that you value us in the same way. You know us, Lord. You know our names. You know Lord, our story, Lord, you know the things that are going on in each of our lives, God. You know the things 
that no one else knows about us. Lord, you know it because nothing is hidden from you. And Lord, maybe this morning, even for some of us, God, we put on a great ex- exterior. Maybe it's not as great as we want it to be, but Lord, we've, <laughs> we've really focused on that exterior thing, those external things, those temporal things, those physical things. But God, maybe for some, they've neglected the internal, Lord, the spiritual things, their heart before you. And God, if there's in any of us, Lord, ruins this morning. God, maybe we know you, but Lord, we're not, we're not dwelling in all the greatness that you have for us, all the goodness, Lord, all the, the promises and the blessings that you have for us, Lord, the peace that you've made available to us because, Lord, there's ruins still internally, God, that aren't being dealt with. Lord, would you deal with those things this morning? Lord, would we open up our hearts fully to you and surrender? And Lord, let you clean house. God, we're thankful that you love us. Lord, you love us even in spite of us. Lord, I pray that God, you would be doing, Lord, a transforming work in our lives. Lord God, make us those gatekeepers. Lord, help us to know how to guard with vigilance, Lord, our hearts. Not just against enemy attack, but Lord, against the things, Lord, that shouldn't belong in our lives. God, make us those singers, Lord, those worshipers, Lord, whose whose hearts, Lord, are just fully in awe of you, Lord, rejoicing in you, Lord, praising you. God, make us those Levites, Lord, who serve you, God, who are faithful and who fear you more than many, Lord, who fear you above all, above all other things, Lord. God, that you truly would be first and supreme, Lord, in our lives. God, would you make us those guards, Lord, who... Lord, look out for others, but Lord, also are mindful of our own homes, Lord. Not not looking out for others at at the detriment to our own homes. And God, would you lead us? Lord, lead us, God. You've called us to walk by faith, Lord, and it's so hard. It's so hard to do, God, because we want to live by sight. We want to go off what we what we can see and what we can have in our hands or in a bank account, Lord. But God, you've called us to live by our trust in you. Help us to do that, Lord. And as we do that, God, would we be those, Lord, whose faith is evident to others, God. That, Lord, as you build and continue to build our lives, Lord, this side of heaven, God, that others, Lord, even enemies, would see the work that you're doing and give you the glory. God, shine forth through us. Lord, make us bold, faith-filled, faithful ambassadors of yours in these days. Lead us in your love, Lord Jesus, to those around us. And Lord, would you do the impossible. Lord, make a way where there doesn't even seem to be a way. God, we trust you this morning. And Lord, as we sing these songs now in response, God, would we not be so caught up with us or be guarded, Lord, towards you? But Lord, would our hearts be wide open to you as we sing, Lord? Would, our, would the profession of our, of our mouths, the, the lyrics of the songs, Lord, match the state of our hearts? Father, we love you. We're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's just as a reminder, we do have the prayer team during the closing songs. We're, we have communion available for those who have put their faith in Jesus. Let's just continue to press into the Lord during this time.
chose the next couple songs, I was thinking of baptism. I was thinking, uh, remembering when I was 19 years old and I got baptized. And I gave my life to the Lord when I was 18 and I had never heard anything about him before that. Never been to church. I knew nothing. And I remember standing in line to be baptized and thinking, just by myself, was, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm going to do this. <laughs> and what a special day that was for me. And then, uh, and then this last week or so, around this time, or around a week ago, um, Charles Stanley passed away. He was an older pastor. And, well, when I was about 25 or 26, I still loved the Lord, but I wound up in an alcohol treatment facility. <laughs> And I was so broken because I thought here God came into my life and saved me and I was a wreck. I was one of those after school special teenage addicts. <laughs> you know? And I thought I wrecked this too. You know. And I went through my rehab, I got out and somebody gave me a book on tape. I had a cassette deck in my rocking car. <laughs> And it was Charles Stanley, and you know, the book was called The, the Spirit-Filled Life. And something that's been coming back to my mind again is he, he said that he started in ministry at a very young age, and then he kind of just hit this plateau, and he finally just, I'm not, it was a long time ago when I heard this, but he fell on the ground and just said, Holy Spirit, I, I need something more than me. And that's when he had this encounter with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit filled him, and his ministry took a, churn, a turn for the rest of his life. And I, I remember something he said, that he found himself saying this a lot, that I'm doing the best that I can. And I've been finding myself, every time I say that, especially lately, because I've been thinking about him and that book and what that meant to me, and I get to that place, I'm doing the best I can. Well, then that became this little tap on the shoulder of when then we need to say, oh, God, I need you to go over my head by your Holy Spirit. I need to be filled. And so I'm saying all that because I chose these songs as a prayer for us to be filled again and again and again. And the second song, I'm, it's a song we're more familiar with. I'm singing it a little slower which I know that's a shock, <laughs> but I heard it slower. I heard it kind of new, so, so this song's called Fill Me. Holy Spirit, the Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. I need you now. I need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Holy Spirit, Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. I need you now. I need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Search my
boldness in this hour. Holy Spirit, the Father's grace, the promised one in Jesus' name. We need you now. We need your power to walk with boldness in this hour. Yeah. 
going to stand for the last song. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every heart Worship you. 